Hi, I'm Sam Sacasa from Vetfolio, and welcome to this special tech takeover edition of vet to vet Today we're talking about parasites and the role veterinary nurses and technicians have in helping clients make the best choices for their pets. Our guest today is Holly Cummings. She's a licensed veterinary technician at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington, and a board member for the Companion Animal Parasite Council. Hi, Holly. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sam, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here this morning. I love talking about parasites and I love talking to and about technicians. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. That's awesome. So tell me, because I'm not sure a lot of our viewers would even know, what is the Companion Animal Parasite Council and what's your role there? So the Companion Animal Parasite Council or CAPC is an independent nonprofit organization that's dedicated to increasing the awareness um, of pet owners and practitioners uh, about the risks that parasites pose to the health of pets and also the family members that own those pets. For the past 20 years, they have focused on a vision of every pet tested, every pet protected. It started out as a resource for uh, practitioners on the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of parasites in companion animals. They're a product neutral resource. So you can visit their website and look at all of the information on fleas, ticks, and tick-borne disease. About 10 years ago, they expanded into a new area of creating prevalence maps. Uh, the beauty of these maps is you can get an overall look of what's going on in the United States. Uh, but the really great thing for technicians in practice is to be able to click on their state and then zoom down to their county and see what's happening in the county that they're practicing in. That really helps us bring that conversation about parasites into the client's backyard. And that's so much more impactful. My role on the CAPC board is as the voice of the veterinary technician. They are so passionate about their vision of every pet tested and protected. They wanted to get every perspective in, um, in this conversation. Uh, and they recognized the importance of the role technicians have in these client conversations. And so I have been able to just lend a unique perspective uh, that technicians have to the board, uh, which has really been one of my favorite things to do. I love it. That's amazing. Those prevalence maps sound really cool. I love that technicians are um, learning more about parasites. I think it's so important, right? With something that we deal with every day, the client education aspect of it is so important. So yeah, I think that's really cool. So talk to me a little bit about preventions. How have they changed over the years? I've been a technician for a very long time. <laughs> Many techs I meet don't remember the days when there really wasn't a lot out there as far as preventives go. Uh, I think growing up, uh, our pets had like the super stinky flea collar and it was gross and you don't want to really cuddle with that because it's nasty. And now we have all these amazing products that make things so much easier for clients uh, to be compliant and also um, easier to just dose the pet. We have options of orals, we have options of topicals, uh, we have products like Brevecto that you only have to give every 12 weeks. Um, and we can still feel confident that those pets are being protected from fleas and ticks. How does Brevecto fit into our more modern flea and tick prevention? Brevecto gives us another alternative uh, when we're having this conversation with clients. Um, I would strongly believe that every client should be treated as an individual, and we need to work to find out what is best for them and their pet. Mm -hmm. um, the 12 week dosing is something that people really grab onto. Oftentimes that's easier for them to not have to give a preventive as frequently. 
Yeah, that 12 week duration, I think is amazing. And just that alone, I think can really encourage client compliance. So we know that there's all of this innovation out there and that it's so evident that pet parasite prevention is important. What are some of the reasons that flea and tick control is so important? I like to talk to clients about how horrible a flea infestation is because I don't think that they quite understand it. Um, the, the thing that really drives the message home I have found is to explain to them kind of the pyramid of flea biomass. And so I'm talking about the different life stages of the flea. Um, so when a client brings their pet in and it has fleas, letting them know that the live fleas that are on their pets are only 5% of the flea population that is in their home. Um, they're like, oh, that's disgusting because it looks like my pet is loaded with fleas. Um, and you say, well, guess what? There's more you know, hanging out in your house waiting to hatch over the next three months. Um, so preventing that from ever happening in the first place is such a better idea than having to deal with that mess. Um, a lot of times clients will bring that pet in because the, the scratching, um, the jingling of the collar in the middle of the night and the chewing on the, the foot or the rump is, is annoying, right? It's driving the client crazy. They're not getting any sleep. Um, so helping them to understand if we, you know, start out with giving preventive, you don't have to ever deal with that problem later down the road. My gosh, I think that that flea biomass is such a great visual to give clients. It's just so shocking. Yes. So yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned that. I think that's a great takeaway. So we know that prevention is less expensive in the long run. It's less traumatic to the pet and to the owner than treating a flea infestation or a tick-borne disease. So what are some of the barriers that you've noticed? Why doesn't everybody embrace flea and tick control? Uh, again, a lot of people uh, have the mindset of why spend the money now on prevention when I can just treat later. Right. Um, one of the things that I think it's really important to talk about with clients who bring that up is that tick-borne disease is lifelong disease oftentimes. Uh, if your pet gets Lyme disease, uh, treatment is going to be extensive uh, and it's going to be expensive. And then if, um, if they know any humans that have Lyme disease, you can kind of um, have this conversation more easily because they probably know about relapse. Once these pets have the parasite or the tick-borne disease, there can be lifelong lasting effects. With these barriers in mind, what are some tips you have for talking to clients about flea and tick prevention? So the way that I approach client compliance uh, with flea and tick prevention, the first thing is making sure that that client is going home with product. Um, they need to have the product that is going to work for them in their hands as they're walking out the door. Uh, the reason I think that that is so important is because then we know that the product has a guarantee. Uh, we know that it is an effective product um, and we know that they have all of the doses they need for an entire year of prevention. The second thing is I like to make sure that the client feels confident. Uh, the way that I do that is I have them give the first dose in the room. Um, I do this with a lot of things. So if, if they have a diabetic patient and, and need to give injections, I'll have them do an injection in front of me with saline. Right. Um, if it's a client that is putting a topical, for example, on a cat, I want to see where they are putting that topical. Um, and I want to make sure that they can, you know, open the packaging and hold the cat and put it in the appropriate place so the cat can't lick it off. Um, I want to make sure that they, you know, can give an oral chew, which usually is not very difficult. Um, and then the third thing is I like to help that client set up a reminder before they leave the room. This is one of those areas that you have to approach each client as an individual. 
if it's someone that is on their phone, you know, they're texting or doing whatever in the middle of the appointment, uh, it is so easy to have a little script for your clients that they can read that says, oh, and my phone's probably going to talk to me now, but um, all you have to do is say, hey, Siri, set a reminder to give preventive to Fluffy every 12 weeks. And Siri will magically do that right then and there. And then you've given the first dose, 12 weeks, weeks later, your phone will give you a reminder. If it's somebody who has um, like uh, a planner, like uh, I am a big planner person. Like I love my planner. Everything goes in my planner. I love checking little boxes and I love stickers. So you notice that it's, you know, mom with her giant planner in her purse and she's pulling things out and writing things down. Um, grab one of those stickers, help her flip the planner forward to the next dose, put the sticker on there, put a little check box next to it because everybody loves checking off a box on a to-do list saying that they completed something. So just getting that client ready with product in their hand, knowing how to use it, feeling confident in using it and having the reminders set up before they leave the clinic will increase your compliance like dramatically um, because it's, and it's so easy. I don't know why we make it so hard. Um, those, those little things are so simple. I think that that's great advice. And I love the idea of just looking at every client individually, right? Like as a technician, a big role of ours is communication and learning how to communicate with that individual and finding out what the barriers are, what they need help with and helping them that way. So I love the idea of figuring out what's going to work for this client so that they remember and sort of tailoring it to that specific person. That's great advice. We know that clients have a lot of preconceived notions about fleas and ticks. I myself was taught that you only need a tick prevention if you lived in rural areas, which I know is not the case now. So how has the prevalence of fleas and ticks changed over the years and how does this affect the need for prevention? That is a really important um, question to address. Um, this is another point again, um, of where we need to address clients individually. And mm -hmm. we also need to make sure we are not having preconceived ideas. Um, one of the best examples I can use for this, when I talk to other technicians, um, in, in a group setting, how many of you have had a client bring in a fecal sample for a heartworm test? I think everybody has experienced that at least once. And, and we assume that clients know things. Right. Um, we assume that they understand that pets need prevention. Um, and that is something that we should not assume. Mm -hmm. I like to ask the client, what is your experience with flea and tick prevention? so that I know where they're coming from and then go from there. So if they have absolutely no idea, then you can approach that with your prevalence. Like this is what's happening in our area. This is a year round thing. Every pet needs to be tested, every pet protected year round for life. And we're gonna move forward from here. This is just what we do. So rather than asking a client would you like this product for prevention for your pet? You would say your pet needs this many doses of this product to make sure they're protected year round. Mm -hmm. um, and then the client has to be proactive in stopping you. Uh, it's a lot easier for somebody to say, no, I don't want to spend that money. If you're asking them the question, it's a lot harder for them to have to make a decision and, and formulate a reason to reject what you're telling them. The, the spread of parasites is dynamic, rapid, ever-changing. Uh, those CAPC maps, again, I'm going to talk about CAPC a lot. They are a pretty, pretty dramatic if you choose tick-borne disease and you scroll through different years and you can watch how rapidly things are expanding. Um, people are finding ticks in areas they didn't think they were before. Um, with all of the 
cities, um, we get microclimates. So fleas and ticks are actually active longer um, in those areas because of the little island heat island effect. So they can really be prolific. Um, we also in, in bigger city areas have dog parks. Uh, dog parks are really a great place to go uh, if you wanna pick up some parasites <laughs> or if you want your pet to pick up some parasites. Um, so making sure that clients understand that just because you live in a gated community does not mean um, that parasites are not present. Mm -hmm. uh, people will say, my dog doesn't leave the backyard and my backyard is clean. And I like to point out that uh, lots of wildlife comes into my backyard and I live in town. Also, there's tons of feral cats running around and, and pooping in my garden. Um, and they are dropping parasites everywhere in your backyard. So even if your dog is only going into the backyard, they still need to be protected. That's really good information, I think, for technicians to relay to clients, because like you said, I think that there is so much inf misinformation and just things that a lot of people don't know and that we shouldn't assume that they know. So lastly, because I think this is something technicians should always be mindful of, how does keeping pets parasite free help support the human animal bond? The human animal bond is really what it's all about. Uh, anybody that knows me knows I am absolutely crazy about my dog. And knowing that uh, helps me remember that every client that walks through the door is there because they're pretty crazy about their pet. If they weren't, they wouldn't be bringing it to the clinic in the first place. Um, preventing parasites really helps increase that bond in a couple of ways. The most obvious way is it's a lot easier to cuddle your pet if you know they're not full of worms or fleas or ticks. The other way that I think um, we really increase the human animal bond here is by making clients part of the medical team. So clients um, really want to do what's best for their pet. We might not always get that message from them, but deep down, they want their pet to live forever. I think we all do. Uh, and they want their pet to be as healthy as possible. And so when they are doing the right thing by protecting that pet year round for life, uh, we should be congratulating them and telling them you're doing a great job um, making sure that your pet is healthy. Um, you know, I sometimes will make a joke when I do have clients give that first dose or apply a topical product uh, for that first time. Uh, if they do a good job, even if they do not the best job, but they get it done, I'll, you know, say something silly like, great job, you're hired. Uh, because they, they want to know stuff. They want to know about the health of their pet and they want to know that they are, are doing a good job taking care. I love that. I love the, the concept of just making them feel empowered yeah. to take good care of their pet. And also that you mentioned that, you know, you love your dog so much. I think that so many technicians, of course, have animals and feel the same way. So if we can keep in mind, you know, we don't want to hear a dog scratch all night or, you know, cuddle with a dog that has fleas or, you know, unfortunately have a dog get a preventable disease. So if we can keep in mind that our owners want the same thing, then I think that that's just really powerful. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Holly. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. And thank you to Merck Animal Health for sponsoring this Tech Takeover edition of vet to vet Check out vetfolio.com for more of our B2B discussions on various topics in veterinary medicine. And remember, patient care starts with self-care.